uh, Northwestern, where she is actually a professor there. Uh, actually, we have an official title here. <laughs> Yeah, the Junior Breed Professor of Design at the Siegel Design Institute, which is, uh, if there was a, a, an idea of, you know, there's these sort of sister cities, this would be one of our sister labs. This is a very good kinship of thinking about design. And Liz comes from a tremendous design background. She got her graduate work at Stanford, so just across the bay. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, and then she's gone on to do really great things in design and HCI, so I'm sure that many things will resonate with her talk around crowdfunding and crowdsourcing. Um, uh, she tells me that she is sick, so if you come to shake her hand, she will give you a gesture like that, which is meant to say, I really appreciate you coming up, but I, I don't want to spread um, more crowd germing, yeah, I guess. I'm bringing them all the way from the Midwest. <laughs> Um, and she's also, uh, she co-founded the Design for America, which is a tremendously influential uh, uh, team to go and look at real design uh, challenges on sort of societal level scale and really gets people outside of this room interested in design. I think she's got a lot to uh, show us and demonstrate about the value of design. So with that, thank you. Thank you so much. Nobody's hiding behind the curtain now. Wonderful. Um, thank you very much. This is such an honor to be here. Thanks to... Bjorn and Eric for inviting me out. Um, I want, before I get started, I want to set a few ground rules. My goal, and I hope it's your goal too, is to have a great, engaging conversation. So if it means we get through one slide and we have a great conversation, that's where we'll be. Um, secondarily, if you have a question, please ask it. Make sense? Okay, great. Um, so actually, just before we get started, anybody have expectations for this talk, things they want, they want to walk away with? Did anybody bring expectations? Or are you a blank slate? Anything I tell you, we'll go. Not like sponges. We You're like sponges. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, don't don't uh, don't um, stop me if you need if you need to. Okay. So it's exciting for me to be here. Uh, I took this picture. Anybody ever been at this corner? It's Pine and Battery in downtown San Francisco. The story of my research, in fact, starts right around this window up here. I was working for a toy company 15 years ago. And um, at the time, and one of the things that intrigued me is I was working with kids actually in the Tenderloin to develop new toy concepts. Um, and what intrigued me is that there was this huge opportunity, huge passion and interest among the kids to help us design new products. But obviously the kids were lacking in training, they were lacking in resources to actually implement the idea. And so there was this, in many ways, an untapped pool of resources and an opportunity for design. And this is this um, dichotomy is always very, very much interesting. And so the work I'm going to talk about today is how is it that we can use technology that affords the new social interactions and the transfer of information to actually bridge, bridge this opportunity. Novices who need training and resources with opportunities and problems. I'm going to talk about two projects that Eric alluded to. The first one is Design for America, and the second one is crowdfunding. And, um, and I'd love your feedback on, on this work. OK, so let's start very real. This is today. This is approximately where Berkeley is. I made the dot pretty big, so I, I hit it. Um, so why, first of all, that I, I really don't have to explain this to you guys, but just to remind ourselves, why do we need creative problem solvers? Why do we need designers? I would argue we need them because the complexity and, and the, the large size of our problems that we face today as society are really um, growing rapidly. So a few problems that interest and intrigue me is that 31% of children in California are overweight or obese. This is actually pretty consistent with um, demographics across the country. Obesity is then linked to coronary heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, which costs a tremendous amount to treat. Another one that this is a study that just came out. I don't know if anybody saw it, but Westerlies from China are carrying things to California. Did people see this? What are, so within what are days, Westerlies? What? I mean, Westerly, sorry, our, our winds, powerful oh. winds that come across, within days are coming across. And I, I just got a chance to go on your new bridge last night, which is lovely, but it's, there's not, it's not contemporary enough that I could find an image of that, <laughs> right? Which is interesting, like I could find like two images. Um, anyway, so this is, this is a, this study just came out in PNAS. And then another one is that 55% of California hospitals report hospital acquired infections. So these are infections that you get when you are at the hospital. So you show up sick, and then you get another illness. Right? Or two or it's like three. bonus. <laughs> no, more than one. <laughs> what? Or more than one. Or more than one. 
Um, so the idea of showing up, um, showing up and, and getting, getting another illness. And one of the reasons this happens is because there's poor hand hygiene among the, the doctors and the nurses. So I'm going to contend that these are challenges that don't just solve themselves. Like we, we know these are problems. They're not just going to miraculously solve themselves. So what is, it, what is it that we do given the complexity of these are growing and the rate of um, these problems are growing? So let's take this example of the, the hand hygiene incident. Um, as I said, one of the sources of, hand, of hospital acquired infections is hand hygiene, poor hand hygiene. So it turns out the doctors and nurses are not washing their hands. So I had, um, this is Mert and Yuri, two, um, two 19 year olds who were learning about human centered design for the first time. They were not, it was not their background, um, but they did a, a six week experience of human centered design. And what they did is they went to the hospital to find out what was happening because they thought, you know, these nurses and doctors are probably well intentioned, right? They're not intentionally not washing their hands. So what does it look like? And I love this drawing. This is a this is a diagram that they did of the floor plan, right, of the of the hospital room. HS stands for hand sanitizer, and everything else, everything else is explanatory. Um, this is the the cart that they move around with the equipment on it. And so what they did is they observed, as you know, this is the start of all. Um, design, the human center design process. And they, what they observed was that when, when doctors and nurses walk in this door, they have so little, especially doctors, have so little time with the patient, and the first thing they do is turn their back to the patient, right? So from a social perspective, they want to walk in and go directly over, but they turn their back. So then they put in this hand sanitizer, so now they can go here, but then when they're on the other side of the patient, they actually can't sanitize their hands. And as it turns out, every after every um, you touch a patient, you're supposed to sanitize your hands every time. So it turned out there just wasn't as many convenient opportunities for sanitizing their hands as there could be. So that was one observation they met. They also had a chance encounter with a nurse in the hallway. They went up to meet a nurse, and she was holding a, a wet water bottle. And she um, took her hand off the water bottle, wiped it on her, on her scrubs before shaking their hands. So the combination of accessible hand hygiene with um, with this this child motion, right? We've all learned this. This is where you wipe your hands, right? Not napkins, not anything your mother told you to do, but on your on your apple. So the combination of things, they decided they wanted to make a portable hand sanitation device that actually could be on the body of the nurses. And nurses. So they made these lovely prototypes, um, and as you can imagine. Um, not, a, not everyone flew, right? They were a little intimidated, but low, low fi um, fidelity. They then eventually got on to um, much more sophisticated models, made over 40 realistic functioning um, prototypes. In the process, they taught themselves how to use a 3D printer, program Arduino boards, um, go through many of the processes of design. They met with the, the nurses and the staff to get feedback. And then eventually they came up with a product that they felt was good enough. They went out into um, a health, what's called a health box incubator. They went into an incubator. They pitched their idea. They got money from VCs. And now here they are, 23 years old. Four years later, they have a company called SwipeSense. Um, they just did a controlled study of this, this hand sanitation device here, in which you squeeze um, to get the hand sanitation and, uh, uh, gel on your hands. And it also tracks where and when you do it. So uh, hospitals can keep um, greater, <coughs> they can keep greater attention on where people are doing it. Question. Are yeah. What, what happens to the disposable gloves, which is a standard procedure when you enter a room? You put it on over. Well, so, you put on your hands. What? You have disposable gloves. Right. Uh, you put it on over that. Why do you do that if you have the gloves? They're sterile. Yeah, but if you touch, I agree, but if you touch you're supposed to sanitize your hands, best practice is sanitize your hands every time after you've touched the patient or anything around. So if I touched Eric, I did some procedure on him, I stepped away, I'm supposed to sanitize my hands again before going back. Otherwise you would have to take off the yeah, gloves. Yeah, otherwise I'd have to put on a new pair of gloves. Uh, no? Well, <coughs> that doesn't usually fit with the way you're, <coughs> if you have your patient yeah. and you're, well, if you're dealing with an infected wound, yes, you don't want to spread. Right. Although it spreads itself anyway. Yeah. So you're really not going to change that. Right. Uh, 
I don't see the purpose on a single patient to be, you know, trying to sterilize yourself each time you move around that single patient. Well, because you're interacting also with the, it's assuming that the environment is sterile, right? And it turns out they did some no, studies on the, you know, the, actually these, these curtains that go around, the bars that come down that you often move around, yeah. filled with germs and are very rarely washed, right? So, <laughs> yeah, it makes you, so, so every time they just moved it around, not thinking I just want a little privacy for my patient, and then they go back, <coughs> there's, there, there are, um, it's possible that they could infect the patient. So the best practice is to every, every, um, every interaction is to sanitize your hands. The ties, they've studied doctors' ties, which are also quite contaminated as well. Many things. Many things on the person are contaminated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, some people are wearing some people are wearing gloves, some people are just mm -hmm. bare hands. So if you're wearing gloves, you're sterilizing the gloves. Right? Yeah, it works both. Yeah, yeah. it works on both. Yeah. Um, so they just did a controlled study. Thank you for those questions. Um, I'll, you know, I took out that slide that has the approved formatted um, procedure. I'll put it back in because I realize I need it. Um, <clears throat> anyway, they, uh, they just did a controlled study. And what they found is they actually were able, with this product, able to increase um, hand hygiene compliance by 64% in a hospital. So for me, this is very encouraging and suggests that we're going to actually be able to, to tackle this problem of hospital acquired infections. So the reason I told you this story in detail was because really what they had to go through to get to this point of impact was understanding, learning about the design, human-centered design process, of which they knew nothing at the beginning. And then they had to go through learning about entrepreneurship, again, which they knew nothing about in the beginning. And what's interesting to me is that these are actually, as you all know, these are hard things to teach. And yet this is what it might take to get us to, um, to people who are capable of both designing solutions to solve these complex problems, as well as implementing them. So if our supply of these people is low, and it's hard to train them, um, what is it that we what is it that we do? That's the question that interests me. Um, and this this is my uh, I posit this relationship that we'll be able to um, increase the rate at which we solve problems if we can increase the number of designer and entrepreneurs. <coughs> so this is my this is the premise on which my work is, is built. Um, so how do we create the question then becomes how do we create critical opportunities for training and acquire resources for these folks? Um, this is the typical way in which they're trained. This is a university. Um, the university uh, building, they may go to venture capitalists. There are ways that we have traditionally trained people. Um, and the question I had is, this, this doesn't scale so well, so is there an opportunity for technology to play a role? And it does seem, based on the research that's been done, there is some opportunity. Obviously, massive online learning is coming into play right now. There's online communities in which people are connected with each other, able to learn, and then collaborative wikis. So there, there is a movement towards understanding how is it that we can train massive numbers of people. There's also a movement here of how is it that we can help people access the resources they need. Uh, collective intelligence looks at how is it that disrupted groups of people can work on an activity together. Um, communities of practice, how can people share with each other. And then obviously e-commerce e is about taking the, um, in some ways, the opportunity to take the middleman out and have uh, designers work directly with consumers. So here's a few examples. This is Odesk. If I wanted a gra uh, logo, I could go to Odesk and hire somebody for eleven eleven dollars an hour. Um, if I was needed an image, I could go to iStock and grab an image for hand hygiene. If I needed an Arduino board, I could go to eBay and get it. So multiple opportunities for this. So the question I have is, how much we harness technology to radically enhance novices' abilities to develop skills and access resources to realize new solutions? And I'm going to talk about two projects. One is in the space of design, and the other one is the space of um, Crowdfunding. I'm going to start with Design for America. Design for America, call out over here. Nice. Okay. <laughs> uh, I have a quick question. So, yeah. when you go back to the, the graph, I'm going to have to step back. Yeah. Um, so, there are, there are kind of two ways of yielding the same graph, and they're, yeah. they're different. I'm just thinking about that because yeah, it please. has this re reference to MOOCs so, yeah. and to, to crowdsourcing. Yeah. One model is that you just want to want to you know, give many, many people the opportunity to participate. Yep. And then all your online systems are basically just filters. And you filter yep. out the people who are most self-motivated, yep. who really uh, want to participate anyways, yep. and you keep those. That's how a lot of 
crowdsourcing work. Yep. That's arguably how MOOCs work, uh, yep. right. where they succeed as well. And the other model is um, that you no, know, you kind of want to you know lift everyone, and right. that um, so the people who are self motivated that will work great, and yep. for the other ones you'll have to work a whole lot harder. So, yep. which camp are you are you in? Is this is this design education for everyone, or is this cap everyone so you find the right number of good designers? I would argue that, well, the vision, the vision is that we have a national network of people working on these problems at all different scales. And so I think you ask a good question. Is everybody, is it just an elite group of people who have gone through this training in this process, or is it absolutely everyone? Um, I tend to, I tend to think that we can, um, we can bring up the, we can raise the, the bottom level. However, the work I'm presenting today is a self-selected group that has gone into this. Does that make sense? And I think we need to get that first group up so we have more role models, so then we can bring the other. That's my general idea. Um, but I do have a vision that we could bring everybody along. That's my goal. Okay, so here's our university. Thanks for asking that. Okay, so in 2009 I started an organization with three amazing students, Mart and Yuri, who were earlier, um, who did the hand hygiene process, were part of this. And it's a network of student designers using human-centered design to make social impact. We're at 17 different universities across the campus. Here's an example of the summer studio. They come together once a year to get training and networking with each other. Um, it's a broader, they're in a broader network of 2,500 people who offer um, advice, mentoring, um, and resources that they might need in this process. Everybody is a volunteer participant. Nobody gets credit. Um, this is a group of students meeting together um, in the Cornell studio. Um, and they're giving a workshop actually to some of their peers. We have the teacher leader model in which we train, we train the students to train the other students to, to understand the design process. Um, this is a professional mentor working with, with some of the students, uh, actually a faculty member at one of the universities. <coughs> Here's a professional designer working with one of the students. So again, all volunteer time. Um, volunteers tend to commit about two to three hours a week. And, um, and they're really trying to, trying to make an impact on these people. Um, What's exciting to me, particularly, yeah, correct. <laughs> uh, what's exciting to me is that 25% of these people are um, women in STEM. So we draw from people across the campus, um, all campuses, all majors. We represent over 65 different majors, and 25% are women in STEM, um, which, to me, as a woman in STEM, is is a very exciting number to have that many people working. Um, and what we're finding is actually is turning out to be a great recruitment tool to engineering majors for particularly for women in STEM. Okay, what kind of problems do they work on? Um, they are tackling local problems, examples of problems, as I uh, suggested at the beginning, is improving hand hygiene, and they're always linked to a bigger problem. So it's not that you're just uh, solving hand hygiene in the local hospital. You're, standing, you're solving it in such a way that then can scale to other places. So it's taking a hyper-local approach so that the students can really understand what's going on um, and, then, and then scale it. So for example, in Berkeley, they might look in a, you know, in a in a area like this to find the problems. And this was really in response to some work that I was doing down at Stanford um, D School, where we had a student came into my office and said, "I'm going to this location for one week. How do I understand everything about them?" And I, I just thought, "Wow, you, know, you can't, you can't. <laughs> it just won't happen." Um, and so I thought, "Well, what if we just take out that distance, have people work hyper local, and then scale from there?" So. Here is Hannah. Um, she's working on a robotic bear to help kids with diabetes um, take care of their, um, monitor their own health, testing with kids. Here's her partner, Erin, also working with kids. And the real life, the idea from, like, from a value proposition standpoint, what we're really trying to do is with the students, we're trying to teach them skills, give them meaningful social experience. The professionals are participating because they're um, enjoying being connected to the talent, as well as there's an interesting thing in which they're enjoying the vicarious, what I would call vicarious experience. So a lot of them will come and say, I say, why do you give this much time to Design for America? And they say, I give it because I wanted this program. I wanted this opportunity when I was a student, and it didn't exist. And so this is very powerful to me. Um, the community likes the actual tangible impacts that we're able to, to make for them, um, as well as exposure to local talent. And then the university, those, those reasons are pretty self -explanatory. So initial evidence, this, this organization is about five years old. Here's some qualitative evidence that we're 
that we're making an impact on these students and training them in an effective way. Um, I like uh, I like Sarah's um, quote. Of, I'm no longer satisfied with the status quo. DFA makes you aware that you have the potential to change things. DFA has been the cornerstone of my education. And this is an employer, um, Trung Lee. We hired her not because she goes to the top university, but because she of doing DFA. And we hear this over and over again. Like I understand they do the classwork, but I you, these kids. You're not sending them out with a problem on a platter, is what somebody told me. They're actually going out and they're having to find the problems by themselves, which is half the problem, half the challenge. So they find the problems by themselves, and then they solve it. And yes, it does take longer than you can get through in a 16-week course. But that I think that's a critical part of um, being a designer and being an entrepreneur. So now we're going to look at uh, DFA, as we call it, Design for America, through the lens of uh, social learning theory. And this is the idea, basically, Bandora had, that learning is a socially mediated experience, and there's three main ways that you can, that you can learn from others. You can see other people doing it. You can do it yourself, or you can hear from other people that you can do it. <coughs> so my question was, this is interesting. How is it that technology is affording our ability to see more people doing it, do it ourselves, or hearing other people that are doing it? And I was, as I was thinking of this question, one of my students, I saw a student presentation. He was talking about Design for America, and he put up this slide. And he said, these are our corporate sponsors. They do not give us any money. But what he was trying to imply was, our work could not be possible without these different, different technologies. And so I probed into that. What, is, what does that mean? How is it that you are connecting with others? Um, and I, I, I was able to hear things like, well, with video chat, we're able to see others and support other teams throughout the country. Um, here's another one in which many studios are all on. Vanderbilt, Virginia Tech, UIC, um, they're all on this on this call, and they're actually, and this is a community partner up here. So they're all able to um, connect with each other. And it seems obvious, but this is a um, this is a new kind of a new way of learning across university, across the country. Um, obviously, on, using online social networking, they're regularly seeing people do it. Um, I thought this was great. Does anyone know of a great free online tutorial for AutoCAD? Um, I'm a beginner hoping to generate some graphics, and then she gets some gets some answers below. So social social search through the Design for America network. Um, we're using online mapping. We have a, a sense of where everybody is. So as people travel around, both when they go home for vacations and they they travel different places, they often meet up with with uh, with the network. And obviously, they're sharing stories of successes. This is um, Barnard Columbia just had a. a Union, or everybody just came back on campus and they're starting up their work again, and they're able to present photos on a regular basis. And everybody's across the across the universities, everybody's tracking these different people to see what the other universities are doing. Um, this is a project out of um, Portland, and to me, it's interesting because they're putting up a video here to share with this on Vimeo to share with the network and actually the broader community. And it's a video about how their product works. And so they de disseminate this to the network and get feedback from it. Um, and then also, in the process of doing that, inspire the other, the members of the network. Um, lots of um, online search to understand. This is Aaron with this Jerry the Bear trying to program. And what you can't see is he's got the computer open on the other side um, with a Google search page open to, to understand how to do the work he's doing. So no teacher in that picture. Uh, also using microblogging a fair amount. This was interesting. A team had gone out to um, work with some some folks who were uh, suffered from a flooding flooding incident, and and the one of the informants texted or yeah, texted them back and said they listened to every detail. Trust me, they did. That then the brilliant minds went to work and had concepts ready in less than 24 hours. So this is feedback that the students are getting directly from the people with whom they're working, and this immediacy of the feedback is very motivating for <coughs> motivating for the students, especially when they're facing all this. Um, you know, the complexity and the challenge of design work and the novices, right? So one of the limitations and consequently opportunities that we're seeing here is we have this distributed network, but now we need a centralized meeting place. We need, they actually need more, even more regular feedback. Um, they need network accountability. These are things they're asking for. We need more feedback. We need more connection. So while we figured a lot of the pieces out in five years, we still have many other pieces that we need to figure out. And they want increased access to instruction, right? Because this is informal. This is not the typical classroom. We're not giving them, every, we're, we're giving them instruction, but in much more on-demand kind of ways. So 
what we've been working on to, um, to do this is we've been trying to be effectively take all the, the kind of natural inclinations and the tools that they've used, as well as the online experience with the offline experience, and create something we're calling the digital loft. Um, the digital loft is an online platform that allows, that takes the, the best of these different um, social media elements and allows them to get instruction, reach out to the community, um, and get the resources that they need. And so from a research perspective, what we've been doing is looking at the complex socio-technical um, interactions that happens when between the designers when you have the system um, and exploring what that, what that looks like in a design context. I'm not gonna go into this, but very detailed models of how is it that people are interacting with the system and in which ways can we make them more, help them be more effective with the system. So that's where that project is right now. The loft is a very large um, project, uh, and we're we're spreading it out to all the studios. So that means we're going to have we have hundreds of users effectively, and <coughs> it's been very exciting and it's personally gratifying for me to first form a community and then form the the tools to to support it. Um, I think often some of my colleagues will say, "Well, I've, I I made a tool, but nobody's come. <laughs> you, know, you can build it, but they will not come." Um, and so it's, I think it's reflective of my background, which is in uh, both design and organizational behavior, which is to cre create the network of people, right, with a meaningful interaction, and then create the technology to support that network. Uh, the second problem project I'm going to talk about very briefly here is, um, again, goes back to this research question, how, much we, how might we harness technology to radically enhance novices' abilities to develop skills and access resources to realize new solutions? So, the area I'm going to look at here is some recent research in the area of crowdfunding. So we've talked about we talked about design. Design for America is a, one of a potential solution for scaling design training, design education, hands-on hands-on design work. But what about entrepreneurship? Where does that where does that fit in? Um, I've been thinking a lot about crowdfunding as an opportunity for scaling this kind of this kind of training and access to resources. So with that, um, I'll introduce you to Tan, Chadwick, and Joe. These are some folks who needed a relatively small amount of money, Tan needed 100K, Chadwick and Joe needed 30K, um, to realize their projects. And so, as you may know about crowdfunding, um, they, didn't go to, they didn't go to NSF um, because they didn't have a track record with NSF, as we know you often have to have. Um, they could have gone to Sand Hill down the street here, but uh, they didn't have connections, right? And they could have gone to the bank, um, but they didn't have equity. So, what did they do? They asked the crowd, and this is where this phenomenon of crowdfunding has come from. Technically, we call crowdfunding as an open call on the internet for financial resources in the form of monetary donation um, in exchange for a product or service. Um, there are over 600 crowdfunding platforms raising $1.6 billion. That's just a stat that just came out, kind of blows, blows my mind. The majority, the people who are earning the most money are engineers and designers, which is interesting. Um, here are some popular platforms. Indiegogo is right in your backyard. It's right downtown San Francisco. Kickstarter, Rocket Hub. You probably, Kickstarter is the one that's grown um, the most rapidly. They're using web technologies, um, such as Amazon Payments and Pay PayPal, to exchange this um, money between the creators and the funders. And in reality, it's really not that different than something we've been doing for a while. Um, this is passing the hat. Has anybody ever in, been in one position or another, either putting money in or playing music? Anybody? What side, Rayorn? What side are you in? You were on that side? Paying money. <laughs> <laughs> anybody been a musician? <clears throat> I've never done this, and I want to do it. I don't play an instrument, but I want the experience of seeing what it is like to do it, so I might teach myself just to do it. Anyway, so this is called it's actually called busking. Um, and the difference with, with web technology, effectively, is it just expands the number of people you can ask, right? This is, this is effectively crowdfunding on a much larger scale. Yeah? Could you comment about the growing need for auditing, transparency, and public Yes. Or any scams? Yeah. We could spend the rest of the time talking about that. There are issues um, with. <clears throat> Not everybody delivers. Most projects are delivered late, right? So if you, even if you expect a, a, a project to come, in fact, there's a great story in which this very accomplished 
because I will keep everybody anonymous, a very accomplished person, um, was running late on his deadline. And he actually hacked into Kickstarter, the Kickstarter interface, because people were leaving negative messages on his comment box, and he hacked into it so that no, no negative comments would show up because he didn't want to he didn't want to sully his reputation even further and have a, a record online because Kickstarter keeps the keeps the comment box up. Um, but there are definitely people who are taking advantage. There's companies who are going on and trolling the website to get ideas for products. Um, and what's interesting is not only are they getting ideas, they're also getting an interest in, or they're getting a sense of how many people are interested in there, right? If it's a, if it's a well-funded project, oh, this might be interesting. Um, on the flip side of that, if you crowdfund and you don't reach your goal, and then you go for VC money, you have a public record of not reaching your goal, and so that can hinder hinder your um, your chances of getting VC money. Uh, so there there are negative practices going on. I would argue that um, there are negative practices going on in every every domain, right? I mean, that's I, I don't mean to. There are many negative things going on, but there's also positive things. Yeah. No, but in this on Kickstarter, no, no, and it's there's not. So what's happening is um, the government has been passing passing legislation because they're concerned that they're concerned about this, and so there's going to be more and more um, there's going to be more and more legislation about the relationship. But right now, on these platforms, it is it is goodwill. There is a, it's a handshake. You know, it's it's trusting trusting that other people are going to follow through. I was going to say, there's, there's some huge transition occurring where some, this house somehow went from, I'm talking about crowdfunding in general, yep. Yep. went from people, the passing the hat, people funding kind of an idea or yep. wanting to sort of support something yep. to almost purchasing products. Like people now expect, it. a lot of them are sort of, hey, we'd like to try this out, help us out, we'll yep. give you some stickers or t-shirts along yep. the way. And people are like, I actually want the product yep. by May because I'm giving it as a gift. It's like, that's not, some, yep. some transitions occur where people actually are expecting a, a real deliverable. Some promise it, but I think in general, yep. the spirit of it is a little bit skewed now. Well, you set me up for Oh, okay. So, <laughs> there's great research. So it's a blend of these things, right? And actually, I'm gonna present a research project that got into that. It's like, what is it about? Why are people really doing this? Um, and we can look at research. There's all sorts of research on why people give. They give out of guilt. They give out of happiness. They identify with something. Why do people buy? And then the other question is, why do people participate in online communities? And in some questions, in some ways, crowdfunding is this intersection of all these different domains, right? And so to understand what is it, what is it that's happening on these crowdfunding platforms? And um, <clears throat> the reason, again, just to reiterate, the reason I'm so interested in this is because I do think crowdfunding is, as this one informant says, it's a game changer. It's influencing who and how and why people can participate. Um, and it takes the, the big guy with billions of dollars um, who makes all the decisions for us. Uh, it gives other people an opportunity. An so I was in this I was in this space actually first thinking about it from the um, the creator's perspective of you know the press has been presenting crowdfunding it's you know, put up your put up your video and you can earn ten billion ten million dollars overnight. Um, and the truth from our research is people actually are earning well below minimum wage if you actually calculate how much time they put into it. People are putting between two and 10 hours into their campaigns. So what is it about um, crowdfunding and why are people motivated to create? Um, so I will get to this. Um, so this goes to Eric's question. The, if we're gonna get more and more people to participate in this, we have to understand why is it that they're um, participating in the first place. So we did a extensive year and a half um, qualitative uh, research project with over 75 creators and then 45 funders. So we wanted to get at the idea of like, why are you going on, for why are you putting your product on and why are you um, funding other people? Um, so it would be interesting to see who has ever given money to a, a project like that. Raise your hand if you crowdfunded. Okay, so we have a, another sample that we can see what, what our <laughs> motives were. <laughs> yes, okay, so think about, yeah, that, excellent. So take, take a moment and think, why did you give? So you have your answer. Everybody have their answer? Okay. Um, <clears throat> just a little more of the sample. The funders had given, um, they had supported between one and 108. There's, there's actually two types of funders. There's like 
the, or there's three types. There's the one-off funder, which is typically like the mom funding her son, right? <laughs> She'll never go back to crowdfunding again. Um, and then there's, there's probably you, I'm gonna put you guys in this category the, where you fund a couple different people from your social network and maybe some other, other networks um, or other products that you're interested. And then there's a group that are, um, as one woman told me, I gave as much money as I've earned myself. If that's her experience, is that she participates in crowdfunding not for the money but for the, the experience of the community. So, which gets to the findings of this study, which is why is it that creators participate? Why is it that funders participate? And Eric was right on by saying people are interested in collecting rewards. This is effectively in commerce, right? I want I want the product. I want whatever it is. I want the snowshoe. I want the um, uh, the 3D printer. But then there's these other there's these other motivations that are also coming out very strongly. Um, which are, I want to help others. I want to be part of a community. I want to support a cause. So, for example, this is, um, which is very typical cause-based giving. This is a, a, a one example of this morning cause is a guy who is um, really into dolphins. And, uh, and there was a dolphin Kickstarter campaign, and he went on and supported that. Not because he wanted the little um, tchotchke that you got on the desk, which was a dolphin um, wing or a dolphin fin, but um, because he wanted to support the cause. And then why do creators do it? Well, at first we thought, well, they're doing it for the money, right? They're, they want to raise funds. But it turns out there's actually a complex um, set of motivations here. They want to expand the awareness of their work, so they want to get out the word. Um, I've had many people say, I, I don't care about the money. Sorry, I just saw a workmate I haven't seen for 15 years. <laughs> Hi, Chris. Hello. That's exciting. Um, <laughs> I started talking about it while um, Anyway, they want to. Um, expand awareness of work, form connections with each other, have their idea validated, um, maintain control. This is about wanting to maintain the creative control of their product. So for example, a lot of designers have the experience of going into a major company, selling their idea, and then having the idea very much change. Um, and then also to learn communication skills. Because we're short on time, I'm just going to no, go into, yeah. It seems one thing is really missing. Yeah, oh yeah, what's missing? Simply create something that couldn't be created otherwise, right? For instance, um, I, I was uh, participating in somebody who wanted to put together a really neat sculpture. Mm -hmm. okay? And, you know, somehow you wanted to see that. And so yep. crowdsourcing, you know, and everybody yep. would get a little copy in the end. But, yep. you know, but then uh, the real thing is that somewhere in a public domain there would be this wonderful sculpture. And I don't see that because well, all of the others are... Well, was it money to get the materials? What was the... Well, but, you know, race is only, is only in the way there. The, the main thing is to actually get something done, right? To get something done. Yeah, and that's really visible and that's very unique and yep. maybe otherwise wouldn't happen, right? So I think but that should be, like, number one of from, the I totally agree. What was preventing the sculptor from getting something done? It was a step before that. Why didn't, why did, why yeah, didn't I mean, he just build it? Obviously, oh, money, of course. Yeah, right? so, so I would put, I, I agree yeah. with you. They're all going to get something right. done. These are the, why do you do crowdfunding? Why are you on this sure. platform? So it's a step, I would argue it's a step before. I, I should be clear about that, thank you. So I'm just gonna point out two that I think are, are interesting that are around, again, speak to this idea of how we can use technology to form um, and to teach people as well, uh, create forms of community and exchange resources in new ways we put before. So I'm gonna talk about creators, interest in forming connections and funders, interest in becoming part of a community. Um, so here are creators. Um, this, this top uh, one comes from a game designer, and as he said to me, um, I'll read it to you, he said, there's definitely a secret handshake. If you meet someone who created a crowdfunding project, you immediately have something to talk about. You can cut through any degree of small talk and talk about something you really, truly care about. So there's an intimacy to the community. Now, given what Eric said, is the population train changing? I would say it is. I think what I want as a next step is to go out and collect more data, because more and more people are are participating, right, which makes the group bigger. And so is the question for me is, is there this sense of elite um, participation? Um, another one from, uh, this is a, a product designer, who said, I would go out and everyone knew about it and say something. Some people were positive, some people had a little snarkiness to it. But overall, for the period of time, anyone that I met or saw knew about it, and it was all they talked about. So uh, again, a lot of, lot of discussions about, um, about community. So here's another, from the funder's perspective, so these are the people that give money, and they're interested in being part of the community, um, and this, this one was particularly interesting to me. There's a whole community of funders created outside that are joining up with each other. Um, this woman described, I follow the campaign, the 
Kickstarter campaign fairly closely. I check the project website once or twice a day in the forums, and I interact with the community online. Mostly the backers decide which direction we feel the game should go. So now you have, the, the, they see themselves as consumers of the product, and they're actually giving um, insight into the, the designer through, through the crowdfunding mechanism about the design direction of the, the project, which is, <coughs> just to sit back and think, very different from a tr traditional product design engagement in which the designer would be actually very far from, potentially very far from the, the people for who they're designing for. Um, yeah. Here. Sorry, I know you're running short of time, but I, I think there's yes. another thing that's happening with crowdfunding yeah. that is people are using it as education yep. in the sense that people fund something and now they're part of, as the way these tools work, you're part of this sort of messaging that's only to you. Yep. And yep. I've seen people, the traditional thing is someone says, hey, we're building the thing. But sometimes I've seen people sort of educate people and say, hey, this is this new thing. We learned this new property about the light and the laser is a little different. And actually, it's a historical thing with Galileo. I've seen people actually put like almost lectures. And I think oh, that yeah. is very much, I would love to study that. Well, so there, yeah, and we, a lot of our research got into this. There'd be, um, <laughs> it's funny, one of the creators said, I mean, I love, it's the, I'm paraphrasing, but effectively, I love the feedback I'm getting. It's really helpful. But don't tell me whether I should use a size five or a size six hex nut, right? Like that was like the level of detail <laughs> was that the that the funders were giving. Like this is actually how you should be designing this. This is much more effective. Um, and then there's the flip side, which is, hey, have you considered using this resource or this material might work better for you? So there's there's a blend of comments. I'm saying the funders per se want to learn about optics, so they yeah. fund somebody that's doing an optics project and mm -hmm. they follow the lessons of optics. I think there's something in there that they follow. They, they fund it and then they get the updates. And the updates yeah. are essentially small micro classes. Yep. Well, they're up, so they're updates on both the product they're making as well as the process, right? right. People are, have to be very transparent. To get people to fund you, you have to be very transparent about what you're doing at all times. And so people are often taking photos of themselves, posting them up, so that, again, this vicarious experience, the funders feel like they can be tracking them the whole time. We're also finding that they stick with the relationship sticks over time. Right? Which is, again, terribly unusual. Like, imagine yourself, for example, if I bought a humidifier on Amazon today, right? Do I even know who built it? Do I have a relationship with that person? And then will I check in with them in 10 years from now, right? If I see something that could be improved. So it's a, a totally different relationship that people can have. Um, okay, just given that we're, we're running short on time, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try and wrap up here. The interesting thing to me here, um, again, is this this idea in which the, there's much more of an intimate relationship with the users with whom they're designing for, um, and the users through this monetary um, donation can actually provide validation for the ideas that they're working on. So one, one woman told me, you sort of wonder if people are gonna like your work, and so it definitely got me more confident which people were clearly interested in it and clearly engaging in the dialogue and supporting me financially. And what's interesting to me about this is it's, it's not just somebody going on Facebook and giving you a like button, right? There's this, Online, online and offline encouragement with the financial backing. So I like it and here's money for it, as opposed to I just like it. Um, and I think the interesting opportunity for crowdfunding is it is creating a, lot, a larger number, effectively, of designers and entrepreneurs with this idea that instead of doing it yourself, you're now in this collective doing it together. Now, crowdfunding is not without challenges. There's a lot of, there's a lot of reasons people don't crowdfund. Uh, which we've investigated. People are fear, fearful of public failure, right? You get on there and you fail, and your campaign is, is, stays on there, and it says unsuccessful, big red line, red line, right? Um, some people have concerns about attracting supporters. This tends to do with who they perceive as the people on in the crowdfunding community. So for example, um, uh, a person working on a medical device was talking to me about, you know, I, I think people would be interested in it, but I don't think these people are in the crowdfunding community. It'll be interesting to see if that changes over time. Um, and then a the time commitment. This is, as I said, people spend between two and 10 hours a day on this. Incredibly um, timely, or time, uh, takes a lot of time. And then the funders, this goes to your point back there, is they distrust whether people will use the funds or not, um, if they're use them wisely. In fact, there was one, one story in which a creator underestimated the amount of money that he needed, which is actually pretty typical because he didn't have training in estimating costs. So much so that, and he wanted to deliver what he had promised to his funders because he felt like he had a commitment to them. He sold his car to get extra money to finish his crowdfunding campaign so that he could deliver the product on time. 
things. So there, is, there are some people who are really trying to, um, to gain trust, but there are other people who will abuse the system. So what we're doing because of this is we're coming up with some tools for crowdfunders that will just help them. Um, two tools quickly that we're working on. This one we're calling Shout Out, which is effectively a visualization tool to help people understand who's in their network, how to estimate the size of it and activate it. It turns out people are not very good at estimating and activating the size and expanding their network. So that's one tool we're working on that actually grabs off um, networking data from different people's um, social networks. Um, and then we're working on a tool we're calling critiquing, which is effectively having people give feedback. We're posting crowdfunding campaigns online, getting crowd feedback before they even post it so that they can improve the idea. So I'll conclude by saying I showed you two projects, Design for America and Crowdfunding. And the goal, really, in both of these is to use technology as a way to enable um, or organize massive numbers of people to learn design and entrepreneurship skills so that they can solve these big problems. And the big vision I have is that we will ultimately have this interconnected network of people throughout the country who are working on problems at a hyper-local level. And they have the skills to work on projects at a hyper-local level, but they can depend on the resources of the larger community. So with that, I'll conclude and say thank you very much for having me. This, is, these are, this work has been done by many, many people. I have great lab mates um, and great colleagues. And uh, this is one of, the, one of the places in which we work. And it wouldn't, I wouldn't be here without them. So with that being said, what do I need to know? Tell me. Talk to me. Reactions. Thank you. <laughs>
gap from prototype to something you can sell is so large that crowdfunding seems to be the money is too easy to get and you don't get enough. So okay. you don't get enough other than money, right? You get the yeah. money, but there are so many other concerns related to design for, for manufacturing, related to logistics and warehousing, and right. all of these things, how you turn this 3D printed piece of yeah. plastic into something that yeah. you can sell in the store right. that many people just haven't, have not learned about. I, I totally get it. And so here's what's exciting to me is that there's, there are these communities forming that says, listen, it's great you can raise that much money, but here's the, here are all the other things you need to do, right? It's just right. like a, a pitch to a VC or a, um, like a hackathon or a pitchathon, whatever. These 24 hour things, like that's not it. That's not starting the company, right? There's a whole bunch, bunch of other work. And so what's happening with, with crowdfunding is these people are actually all getting together um, and they're connecting with each other and sharing stories with each other about, hey, listen, have you thought about, have you thought about manufacturing? Have you thought about um, shipping? There's a wonderful story from, from a man who said, I had calculated costs for everything except for the time and the energy it would take to ship. And he said, I spent a week straight in the post office. Like, you're putting on stamps, sending stamps, right? And these, these parts that people often miss. And so one thing is they're connecting with each other. The other thing that's interesting is there's a set of professional services that are coming up that allow people that are effectively offering to help in this way. And you give them 5% of your profit if they help you um, manufacture and deliver the product. Um, so yes, this is happening. So the question from that then, Bjorn, will be, if this professional, if there's, this is becoming a professional field, right? Will the novices still enter? Right. I, I think it's a, it's a great question. Yeah. The answer right before you that is there's sort of a, a sports phenomenon mm -hmm. where sort of real sustainable money is put in that back in the I'm sorry, the real sustainable money is what? The, the sustainable money is made back in San Francisco, not in Boulder. Yeah. Can you explain what you mean by that? Well, I'm sort of, this seems to be this giving is sort of fall more into equity. Sure. Right. Hazard, equity uh, right. Yeah, yeah micro lending, yeah, is where I. Yeah, so where there, there would be a, uh, there could be an underlying contractual relationship that's, that, that again, would be another threat on the, on the founders. On the creators? On the creators. A threat on them. I don't know, what, what that makes me think of is there's interesting new um, relationships being formed around funding, right? We know VCs invest in companies and then they come and advise, right? You get both money and mentoring. Um, Stanford right now, I just saw in the magazine, they're, they're now, um, students can take loans from Stanford alumni for their education and then you can receive mentorship as part of that loan experience, which to me is it's just this, this notion that it's not just about the money, it's about the connections and the mentorship to get you to the point where you can repay the loan, which is, I think is very interesting, right? You don't just give somebody money, you make sure they can, they have the skills to pay you back, which is interesting, yeah. Okay, it seems like, um, I was just thinking one other fear after Bjorn's comment, um, one other fear for students is they might come up with a really nice product, they might have a good plan for manufacturing, but the, actually the fear of the project Getting too large. Oh yeah. The, the pebble phenomenon, where they had their yep. whole manufacturing uh, yep. line set up for San Francisco, and then they got with a thousand percent of their goal, and then completely relocated. So. Yeah, that's that's a pretty common for the people who are successful. That's pretty common, right? Like one person said, like, where did the last three years of my life go? <laughs> like, I was just this was a side little project. Um, what's so there's gross underestimation of what it will take. Um, there's also gross overestimation of how many people will fund you, right? There's, there's quite a bit of um, misestimation at this point. Um, what intrigues me is how can we actually share information more, um, more transparently with people so they know what they're getting into. I think the platforms haven't been as transparent and for business reasons, they, you know, they get some percentage, the more people they get on, the more money they raise. Um, but I think there's a, there's a real opportunity for the community and the crowd to actually be more transparent about what it, what it actually takes and whether you're actually ready to, 
ready to go for it. Thanks, anybody. All right, well, let's thank yes. Liz. Uh, fabulous, thank you for well, thank sharing you. your vision, yep. and, and I hope we work more with you and your group. Okay, thank you. She's obviously going to stick around a little bit here if you had a couple of remaining questions, and um, thank you again. Thank you, Great. everybody. I realize. No way. Did you know that?